started. Um, so welcome to this webinar. We apologize for having to reschedule from last week, uh, but here we are. This is a webinar that is focused on high conflict divorce um, and how to tips for dealing with a high conflict co-parent. Um, so we're going to launch into that topic in just a minute. Uh, and I just want to also say that during the course of the webinar, if you have any questions, please put those in the Q&A. You can go ahead and do that um, by clicking the Q&A icon on the bottom of your screen and typing a question in there. Um, if you would like to not have your name be attached to the question, just select to post as anonymous. Um, otherwise, your name will be displayed for the people that are here on the webinar. Um, you can also choose to send me a question in the chat and it's set up so that you can only send it to me and then I would be the only one that sees that so other attendees would not see the question that are coming in through the chat. So we want to answer your questions and Michelle's going to deliver some information here in just a moment. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Melissa Rosenberg and I am a um, licensed therapist and I work with clients who are in all phases of the divorce process. Um, clients who are dealing with early stages of ambivalence, trying to determine whether or not they are looking at repairing or, um, re or removing themselves from their relationship. I work with clients who are in the middle of high conflict or emotionally charged divorce situations, and also clients who are at more at the tail end or post-divorce and trying to pick up the pieces. Um, I also have a, couple, a practice working with couples who are repairing relationships, and I do a number of different things. But in this context, I am here to support um, this topic and helping you all learn about how to deal with high conflict co-parents and navigate high conflict divorce process. So I'm gonna turn it over to Michelle, who is the owner and managing attorney of Delino Law Group. Hi, thanks for being here. I'm Michelle Delino. Um, like Melissa said, I am the owner and managing attorney of Delino Law Group. We're a full service family law firm um, with six divorce attorneys. We take cases pretty much everywhere um, in Western Washington, sometimes uh, elsewhere, but mainly in King Pierce and Snohomish counties. We deal with a lot of high conflict divorce, unfortunately, um, but also probably fortunately because it means that we know how, and it also means that if you're dealing with that, you should know that you're not alone. Um, it, it is not an uncommon situation to be in what people call a high conflict situation. Um, what I'm going to start with first is like, so if you're here, you're here the day before Thanksgiving, and you're probably not here just to get information that you could, I don't know, download offline or whatever. You're probably here because you're looking for some answers. You're probably here because you're stressed out. Maybe you're in the middle of a case. Maybe you're thinking about leaving and you're scared too because you think it might get to be a high conflict situation. So I'm just going to tell you, like, I don't have any magical answers. You might not want to hear that. You might be hoping that I do, um, but I don't. I have some tips and some things that you can do um, to get through it, but I don't have that magic answer. A lot of people come and they just want to know, how do I make this stop, right? So I'm just going to talk really generally and really honestly with you because I tend to find that's what people want. Um, you don't want me to tell you everything's going to be great during your divorce process because it's probably not. It's probably going to feel painful. Even if you want it and you know it needs to happen, it's going to feel stressful. And if you've got somebody on the other side that is what I would call high conflict personality, and we'll talk a little bit about that today, it, it's just not going to be great. And a lot of people want they have the rip the bandaid off mentality, right? I ripped the bandaid off, I did this, and now I want it to be over as soon as possible, like running a hundred meter sprint or something. Um, and it doesn't work that way. Divorce, especially a high conflict divorce is a marathon. It is not a sprint. And you also have to sort of realize that and accept that to make it through. If you don't, you're going to be miserable. So it, it, there's just no other way around it. Everyone would love their divorce to be finalized in 90 days, but the average divorce in Washington takes six to nine months if there are property or children. Um, and if you have a high conflict divorce, I would say you should probably adjust that realistically, especially if you're in somewhere like King County with a case schedule to uh, nine to 18 months. That's just the reality. And the sooner that you can come to grips with that is going to be the sooner that you can start to prepare yourself to get through your divorce in a healthy way. And, and I'll tell you this too, High conflict situation, if you're here, you're trying to get information, I'm going to guess that it's not your fault. I mean, it might be, um, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but you, if you're looking for information and you're dealing with this, that means that at least you have the insight that it's going on. Um, there are a lot of people who just don't have the insight that the way the amount of conflict that they're in is not normal. They think it's normal, probably because that's how they live their lives and they're used to it. They think it's fine. If you're here, 
and you're looking into this topic, you probably know that this level of conflict is not healthy, not normal, and you don't want it to continue. So you should feel really good about taking that step. I mean, you really, really, really should. Uh, a lot of people, like I said, just are completely detached from it. And that usually means they're the problem if they think everything is fine. Um, but I will tell you, it's just another preliminary thing. I would encourage you to take a look at if you are part of the problem. And I'm not saying that you didn't come here for me to yell at you or tell you all the things that you've done wrong, because I'm not here to do that. But I think it's very important for you to look at whether you are contributing to conflict in any way. And it could be that the other person's driving conflict, but it could be in how you're responding. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit. So just have an open mind and think about, are there things I can do to get through this, but also a deal with that high conflict person, but also are there things I can do better um, as well, just not to contribute to the conflict? Because, you know, the old saying is that it takes two people to have a conflict. And I, I typically believe that, but at the same time, there are definitely things in a high conflict situation where one person is really driving it and the other person is kind of just reacting. And that's a really tough spot to be in if you're um, the one reacting because you can feel very powerless. So let's talk about first, what is high conflict divorce? And when I say divorce, um, you know, a lot of people are in the middle of divorce or thinking about divorce, but it can also just be the end of a long-term relationship or a co-parenting relationship. A lot of the time people might, um, with or without kids might cohabitate for a long time and Washington recognizes committed intimate relationships. So there's division of property in those relationships. And if you have children together, even if you're not married, there's a reason to have a parenting plan and child support. And that can lead to, um, you know, a need for high conflict uh, interaction as well. So it's not just divorce. If you're here and you're thinking, oh, this is just divorce doesn't apply to me. Don't think that because uh, these tips work for any kind of uh, family law situation. So you're not alone if you are unmarried and going through something like this. So just putting that out there. But what is it? Um, it's when a relationship, a marriage or a parenting relationship or just cohabitation ends, the, the relationship ends. And doesn't just end from a financial perspective, it ends from an emotional perspective. And basically I would say like a war begins <laughs> and that's terrible. Um, and you don't want to find yourself in the middle of that. And I think it's a big reason why people don't move forward sooner when they know that a relationship is failing. Um, it, now, Melissa will tell you, and I'll let her talk about this in a few minutes, that it's not, I'm not just saying you should throw up your arms and say, oh, I'm done. My relationship's difficult. I, I'm going to get a divorce. I'm not someone to advocate for that at all. I typically tend to think if there's anything you can do to focus on rehabilitating your relationship, you should do that first because you obviously invested in your marriage. You might have kids or you might not, but it's the most, um, it's, it's the biggest legal contract and the biggest commitment you've ever made. So it's definitely worth trying to salvage. I'll let Melissa talk about some options with that if you're on the fence in a little bit. But it, basically high conflict begins when everything is a fight, everything is a hassle. Someone is making everything absolutely difficult. They may or may not be unreasonable because you might not even be negotiating things yet, but they are making things difficult. And the important thing to know is that that is often happening because that person needs to feel powerful in a situation. Um, and that is not your fault, has nothing to do with you. So divorce with a high conflict, divorce or separation is when essentially everything is a fight and there's poor communication. Poor communication can be because there's no communication. Maybe you're not talking to that person at all, or maybe you're only talking through attorneys and that's getting stressful. Um, but sometimes it can just be that there's no communication or sometimes it can be that there is a lot of ins insulting things going on. There's a lot of abuse going on that's emotional or financial. There can be all kinds of things like that that can happen. So that's what high conflict is. It's what it sounds like, unfortunately. Um, and the reality is that some spouses are able to move through the divorce process and cope with just bouts of anger, maybe a bout of depression, um, before moving on and beginning a healing process. And they can even do that in the divorce, right? There are other people that get stuck in that anger or that depression and they cannot move through it. And then they infuse that anger and everything else into the process and then you're stuck in the middle of it. And I think it's very important, I'll let Melissa talk for a few minutes too about what to do if you're in the process and feeling like maybe you're getting stuck because the biggest thing I find is if you cannot 
find a way to still move through and you're stuck in anger or depression, it's going to affect your case. It's going to affect when you are in a mediation session, you won't, you'll be unlikely to come to a resolution. It's going to affect um, how you deal with your children and what that manifests to them. It, it's going to affect everything. So Melissa, do you want to yeah. give a few tips about that? And then I'll <laughs> launch back into the, the other. Yeah, the other definitely. Um, well, Michelle mentioned just kind of going back a little bit, the, um, if you're on the fence, if you're not really sure what, where your relationship is headed and maybe you're involved with somebody who is high conflict or your relationship has become high conflict and you haven't determined whether or not you're going to stay together or not, um, definitely reach out for support. This is, it's a really hard thing to be stuck in that ambivalence state and especially when there's a lot of conflict at play. Um, so couples counseling is an option. There's also something called discernment counseling, um, which is a process for couples that is kind of a short term problem focused solution focused process to help discern whether or not this relationship is going to move forward or whether you're going to move in the direction of separation. Generally in that process, it's short term, you know, just one or two months probably to really hone in on making a decision and, and get you out of that stuck space. Um, and generally you engage in that if, if one or both spouses is highly contemplating separation. Um, I also work with people on an individual basis who are feeling really stuck. Maybe their spouse isn't open to counseling or doesn't feel like that would be a good process for them. Um, I work with people on an individual process in kind of a divorce ambivalence problem focused way to help them move through that stuckness and determine whether or not there's um, a repair hope there and, and the possibility of doing counseling or whether they need to move forward with separation and how to actually begin to take some steps to do that when, when that um, feeling of being stuck or ambivalent is, is kind of taking hold. And then kind of moving forward a little bit, if you are dealing with a, a partner or a former partner who is really high conflict, one thing that I hear uh, people say all the time is my ex is a narcissist. And so I want to throw that out there because that word comes up a lot and you might be thinking, oh yeah, because my ex is a narcissist. Um, so just want to say narcissistic personality disorder is an actual diagnosis and not one that anyone, anyone is qualified to make unless it's a mental health practitioner who's actually assessing the person who they're talking to. However, um, you're probably familiar with what narcissistic traits are and you might have recognized what narcissistic traits are, traits of this personality disorder. And there are a lot of the things that Michelle mentioned. It's kind of this idea of control, this person who is exercising potentially abusive um, behaviors because of their need for control, maybe self-importance. A lot of times there's patterns of grandiosity and self-importance, entitlement, um, usually kind of a lack of empathy and usually a um, um, behaviors that are manipulative. So those are some of the things that you might be thinking of pertain to your high conflict um, co-parent. And some people might call, call it narcissistic, but just wanted to kind of put that out there as well. Um, when you are dealing with a person like this or in a relationship dynamic like this, it's really, really important to understand what your limits and boundaries are. And so, you know, when it comes to feeling stuck in your anger and depression, like Michelle mentioned, you have to figure out where you have control when you have somebody that you're trying to deal with who's controlling. Um, likely there's been some toxic communication involved and it's really important to avoid engaging in that toxic communication. So if you're you know, going through a divorce process, make sure you're communicating with your attorney and letting your attorney communicate for you. Make sure you're communicating in writing. Make sure you are you know, not going down the loop or getting pulled into the rabbit hole of toxic communication. That's often what the other person is trying to pull you into. And so avoid doing that because that's not gonna help you and it's just going to spiral your anger and depression even further. Um, so be cautious, be mindful, and be strategic in your communication. Take the high road when you can, even when it doesn't feel like that's what you want to do. Um, set your limits and boundaries. Understand where those are. And that might have been hard to do in your relationship, but if you're ending this relationship, it's going to be more important than ever in your separation. Make sure that your limits and boundaries are in line with your own clear goals. And in order to establish your own clear goals, you have got to make sure that you have a strong support network in place, right? So definitely if you're in the divorce process, making sure you have a strong attorney on your side who is going to help advocate for you, help you clarify your, your goals in this process, 
and um, help you, you know, understand how you're going to navigate that from that standpoint. But you also really need a strong social support system. You know, who are the people around you who are positive supports? Really consider working with a therapist if you're dealing with a high conflict person in the divorce process. Um, also to further clarify your goals, you know, your communication goals, your limits, your boundaries. A lot of those things are really, really hard to understand if you've been in um, a toxic communicating relationship. Um, so have strong support network, understand what the limits and boundaries are. You know, if this person that you've been dealing with has some of those narcissistic traits that we have talked about, it's not going to be easy. And so let's make sure that you have a strong um, team in place to help get you through this and help you get to where you want to be. Great. Um, that's really, really good tips. Some of those are mine too. So we'll get to that. But um, I think, uh, first of all, when I talked about it, thinking about if you're part of the problem, this is a, a list of a few things I always tell people to think about if you're doing. And a lot of the time, you might be and not realize it, or it might be that, oh my gosh, this other person, like the narcissist that people like to call their spouse, um, is the person doing all of these things. And just take a look if you're doing these things. First thing is usually someone who's involved in a high conflict case, one person has a preoccupation with blaming others. I mean, maybe you don't even realize you're doing it, or maybe you realize they're doing it, but it's all about blame. And I'll tell you this first, Washington is a no fault divorce state. So as horrible as it sounds, it doesn't matter if someone was cheating on you. It doesn't matter. I'm not gonna say it doesn't matter if someone abused you emotionally or physically, it does matter. So you should know that, but it doesn't matter as far as allocating resources or money in the divorce. You can't stop a divorce from happening. It doesn't matter if someone, um, you know, wasted money on something they shouldn't have. They might have to be accountable for that in settlement, but no one's going to, in the court process, hold them up and say, you are to blame. That's just not going to happen. And we, that's, and there, you don't have to prove fault for a divorce. So a lot of the time, a court or a mediator doesn't want to hear about that. And that can be extremely frustrating, but taking the blame out of divorce takes a lot of the power away from that person that is blaming you. If you just aren't like, I'm not going to blame you back. I'm not going to go there. Um, it's going to be better for you. The second thing is the manifestation of that blame that results in, I would say, verbal, physical, financial, or legal attacks. And when I say financial, a very common theme in a high conflict case is someone uh, seeking to control, to control the finances, cut you off from resources, um, or maybe you've never had access to the finances and you don't even know what exists. Um, that stuff can create a high conflict situation and it's not okay. And usually that blame, you know, it could also be that there's domestic violence involved or there has been, um, you know, a blame for someone being angry in the relationship. And I'm not saying that anyone here is doing those things, but if they're being done to you, be aware that that's what's going on. Um, and control is usually a manifestation of some kind of blame it is what we find in these kinds of cases. So if that's happening, acknowledge it and think about ways to deal with it, which we'll get to. Um, I would also say too, that people that are involved in cases, and this is something that I think everybody at some point is probably a little guilty of. I was probably even guilty of it in my divorce and that is um, unmanaged or rigid emotions. So if you feel like your emotions are getting in your way of being able to have conversations about things that need to get accomplished either with your attorney or with the other party. Um, you know, that's a thing. You definitely want to make sure that you're finding a way to manage those emotions so you can show up for your kids every day so you could be productive in your job and so you can deal with the case in a way that is as objective as possible because and a lot of time that can mean just not dealing with it until you need to. Like if you have engaged an attorney and you're just waiting for a mediation or you're waiting for a hearing or something, you need to just be able to trust that when the time comes, you'll deal with those things. You don't need to be dealing with it every day anymore. Um, so manage your emotions as best as you can to have a normal as much as you can day to day and not let the emotions of the divorce spill over into every part of your life. We're human beings, so we do that, right? And that's where, you know, having that support network that Melissa was talking about is extremely important. But realize if your emotions are spilling over into dealing with things, that can contribute to a high conflict case, even if you're just responding. Um, traits or Melissa just talked about this, and this is super important. Traits are poorly or poorly um, or fully formed personality disorders like narcissism. And like she said, narcissism is, is a diagnosis. And there are other diagnoses as well. If you have a case with children and you think that's going on, 
it's not enough to just say, oh, the mom or the dad is a narcissist. And that's the reason that, you know, this co-parenting is terrible. Everybody says that. And I'm not saying it's not always, it's not often true, but sometimes I, I tell my clients this because it's true. If you think that's going to be an issue with parenting and it's not just this person's a narcissist and I hate them and I don't want to live with them anymore. If you can put that aside and you think it's actually going to have a nexus with parenting, that can be a time to look into doing a parenting evaluation in your case, which involves psychological testing um, of both parties and an evaluation of your parenting. A guardian ad litem also could be appropriate, but if you really think there is a disorder, um, a diagnosis, something that needs to come out of this that needs to be addressed in a parenting plan or long-term, and it's not just this person's a narcissist and I hate them. <laughs> if it's like this person's a narcissist and it's going to ruin my children's lives or be a real problem, then you wanna look at a parenting evaluation. Even though that's gonna be time consuming and costly, it is worth it. I cannot tell you how having knowing like what is really going on with the other person and knowing that yeah it wasn't just me there really is a problem and then having that person um doing recommended counseling or therapy can make such a difference if you have to co-parent with this person long term and the only real way to do that is to actually get a diagnosis not just to throw around the narcissist term and i totally understand why people do but it's like melissa said it's a real thing um so important to know that Another thing that people do in high conflict cases to evaluate whether you're doing is being stuck in the past um, because that won't give you the mindset to really move forward. This happens a lot. Um, sometimes the other person is stuck in the past and they're blaming you for things and then they're acting out financially or legally. They're filing a motion on every little thing. They're trying to get you to waste a ton of money. They're denying you visitation. They're doing all those things because they're stuck in the past. And frankly, they're really pissed off. Um, if you're stuck in the past and doing that, you should stop. If you're stuck in the past and thinking about, you know, just how like upset you are about it, that's when the time for you comes to realize you need to manage those emotions and you need to get in some kind of therapy because if you don't, it's going to affect your whole case and probably your future. So it's a good time to take stock of that. The other thing that I find that people do is they constantly defend their own behavior um, and attack the other person's behavior as much as anyone will listen. And I'm going to talk about some ways to diffuse that and ways not to engage, including social media. Don't do that. Um, but, you know, if, if you or the other party, if somebody is constantly attacking things that you've done, it, some people come to me and they say, Everything I do, he or she turns around and uses against me. So if I offer to pick up the kids early, I'm trying to steal their time. If I say, hey, we're going to be 15 minutes late because we went to a movie and it got out late, I am somehow now like delinquent. If I ask their input on something, I'm not making decisions. You know, it's like no matter what you do, it's wrong. And then they're attacking the other person. And you don't want to engage in that. If someone's doing that to you, you can stand your ground. If you're doing that to someone else and don't realize it, find a way to stop and take stock of it because then it's just gonna be this ping pong back and forth. And unfortunately, that's really what does happen. Um, so how to get through, right? I mean, that's why you're here. You wanna know how to get through this and not just for me to tell you what it is. Although I think it's important first for us to have this conversation about what this is because you might not really realize some of the why behind why it's happening and that can help um, diffuse it. But how do you get through this? I mean. First thing, and some of this stuff is gonna sound really obvious to you, but I think you need to hear it because no matter how many times you hear things, uh, I learned this, it takes seven times for you to hear something for you to really get it or remember it. It's so true. I mean, it really is. So, you know, it's important. First thing is let your spouse like really own their own behaviors. Do not take it personally. That sounds so obvious because like this is your former spouse. Of course you're gonna take it personally. They're attacking me, right? No, don't take it personally. Um, see them as just over here do not take it personally just realize that it wouldn't matter who it was that was involved with this person they would have a problem with them so it, it's not really targeted towards you and it's about their own insecurity it's about their need to control it could be about their own narcissism it could be about any number of things so do not take it personally it's their issue you have enough of your own stuff to carry around like drop your baggage you don't need to carry theirs and yours it's just not necessary the second thing and this is really important um, you don't have to become a target for abuse. If you, a lot of the time I will have clients or talk with people who are still engaged with this kind of communication with their, uh, with their 
spouse and they're thinking, well, we're trying to work it out. We're trying to save on attorney's fees. We're trying to do all this stuff ourselves. And the reason that you're still doing that like a year or two later is because it's not working. And because that person is not treating you respectfully, that person is not able to like modify or control their behavior. So if you feel like this person's abusing you, I'm not saying don't try and talk to your spouse. That's not my message here. But if it's a high conflict person, don't because they're abusing you through that communication cut off the communication, cut off the contact and get someone to do it for you. That is the best time and money you will ever spend um, at all. And it also will help preserve a co-parenting relationship later because the more that you have fights and conflicts with that person on your own during the divorce, the harder it is to heal from that later and really ever move past it. Um, I'm not trying to say that attorneys want to fight for you, <laughs> but they will. And if you're having that happen, attorney to attorney, it takes some of the personal aspect out of it and it becomes more of a business dealing, which is what this should be to get you through to the other side so you can start the co-parenting or just never see that person again if it's just about debts and assets. So don't become a target for abuse. If you're communicating with them and it's not going well, cut off contact, just cut it off, have someone do it for you or take a break if you don't have representation. But it, there's just no reason to feel like it has to manage your life and you have to keep the communication going. You literally don't. And that's kind of a good thing about separation. Um, another thing really is don't fall for people's tactics, I, I guess I should say. Like if someone says or does it or does something that you don't agree with, don't feel like you have to get in because they're playing an emotional card. I mean, maybe they're acting sad. They're telling you, you know, they're sorry. They're trying to evoke pity or they're just being angry and threatening you to intimidate you. If someone's doing something like that, don't take a look at what, what's really going on. If someone's like, if someone left you and yet they want you to do something for them and they're like, oh, I, I, you know, I miss you and I'm sorry this is happening. It, don't go down that road. Don't feel pity for them. Um, just don't do it. It's not worth it. And it's probably a game, unfortunately. So don't go there. If someone is, you know, blaming you for stuff, that's like I talked about before, that's their issue, not yours. So don't fall into that. Stand your ground and step away from it. Um, don't be bullied. Melissa talked about this earlier. This is really important. Setting boundaries is so important. If you don't know what your boundaries are, you don't know when your spouse or soon to be former spouse crosses them. You need to know what your boundary is if you're still going to communicate with them. Um, and you might have to do that through co-parenting or just in general while you're trying to work things out. Set your boundaries. And if they cross it, then that's it. And then you pull back and take some time for yourself and then decide whether, um, you know, you, you want to re-engage, but end a conversation, end communication. Um, otherwise, the behavior is going to escalate. There's no winners in, in something like that once someone crosses your boundaries. There's usually no coming back. Sometimes you can tell them, hey, this is my limit, and you crossed it, and you can move forward. But other times, you can't. Um, and then, you know, I mentioned this earlier, but you need to recognize that a destructive spouse is literally using you to feel powerful. And they probably don't know they're doing that because there's something wrong with them that they need help with. But if you keep engaging with an abusive spouse or someone that's narcissistic or has all these things, you're feeding into their need for control in the relationship, even though the relationship is ending. So don't feed into it. Um, a destructive spouse also, they really don't care how long a legal process is because it's a way of staying connected to you in a twisted sort of way. I mean, to them, it's better to be an enemy than a nobody. So they will use the process to keep pressuring you. Um, make sure that you have representation that understands that and can help you know, shield you from it. And just recognize it's going on and it's not your fault. And the more distance you have, the harder it's gonna be for them because they're gonna be really mad because um, they wanna have communication that's negative to control you. Just don't let them do it. Here's a super, super important one. This might sound obvious. Do not let your children be part of the discussion. When children become part of the divorce, a spouse can use them in a number of ways to inflict pain or gain an advantage. And that is really, really terrible. A lot of the time, especially when children are teenagers, one parent may confide in the child and that is completely inappropriate and it really only hurts the child. Also too, um, and Melissa has said this before and it's so true, don't talk negatively in front of your children, either fighting with that other parent or about the other parent. Don't talk to your friends or your parents or whatever talking about what a piece of crap their mom or dad is because they're 50 percent that mom or dad and even though you're not talking about them it, it makes them feel confused and conflicted and it's just obviously it sounds obvious not to talk crap about the other parent in front of your kids but it can happen you can be frustrated 
you can be on the phone and you might not think that they're listening, but it's really important to realize that it conflicts children in a way that is indescribable because they are partly that parent and it makes <laughs> them feel like there's something wrong with them. So yeah, you don't I want, want to, to add on to that, Michelle. Yeah. Uh, exactly. I mean, the kid, kids, that is their parent. That is part of who they are. And so to hear something that's really negative about that parent, even if you're feeling that way, is really confusing for them. Not only that, at some point you may be sharing parenting time with this other parent and they're going to need to feel safe and secure with the other parent, regardless of how you feel about them. And so, you know, it's very confusing if they have all of these ideas that have been, you know, um, told to them or negative emotions surrounding the other parent. Um, and now they're going to be asked to spend the weekend at their house. So it's going to be really, really important to, you know, just try to keep your kids out of it as much as you possibly can. They don't need to be your sounding board. Have a therapist, have a strong support network, network and don't involve the kiddos. Absolutely. And on that note too, another tip, this sounds obvious as well, but it, it can be a blurred line. Don't use your kids as messengers, even for really what you might think is a benign thing like, oh, I'm, we're going to be a little late this weekend because, you know, mom wants to take me to this or that, or uh, dad's had to tell you this, or don't, even if it seems really benign, don't do it. Don't use your children as messengers. It's not their role. They didn't choose, number one, they didn't choose either of you as parents, and they didn't choose to be in the middle of a divorce. Um, and just don't. And also don't allow your spouse to use children as agents of guilt. Um, oh, you know, which happens, unfortunately, um, in a high conflict divorce, especially, it, it can be impossible for a child to be trapped in the middle. So don't use children, to, you know, and don't let the other parent do it. If the other parent's doing it, address it with your attorney right away so they can address it and it can be acknowledged and it can stop. Um, there's nothing worse because it will damage parental relationships for years to come. I have cases where we're dealing with people post-divorce when they've been divorced for eight, nine, 10 years. And there is now issues with um, the co-parenting or kids feeling conflicted, all kinds of stuff because they've been put in the middle, even post-divorce. So just, just don't do it. Um, <clears throat> here's the other thing about that. If you're in the middle of a divorce or you're post-divorce and you're co-parenting, you are going to have to exchange the children. Find a way to have a peaceful exchange. Sometimes that might mean exchange in a public place or with minimal interaction or dropping off children curbside in front of each other's homes. The exchange is like, it's like the number one tension point. I deal with exchanges all the time when I'm drafting plans and I really try to look at the parties and think, what makes sense for this, this family? In some cases, everybody gets along great. My favorite ones are when you know, dad drops off at mom's house and comes in and, you know, has a cup of coffee with mom and her new husband and everybody chats and it's great. That almost never happens. Sometimes it happens many years post-divorce. Sometimes it happens right away if people are super amicable and mature, but a lot of the time it just doesn't happen. So don't expect that to happen. Um, common ways that you can neutralize exchanges in high conflict situations are this. And it's gotten a little trickier in COVID. I won't, I won't be honest. My favorite one before used to be the Starbucks exchange where you pick a Starbucks, parent A goes to Starbucks, goes inside, gets a kid's cocoa for the kid or a cake pop or whatever they like. So they have a positive association with the exchange and they stay in there. Parent B comes outside, pulls up right out front and will text and say, I'm here. That's all they have to say. You don't have to engage in a conversation. Don't say, get me a coffee. And they say, I'm here. And then parent A can look outside and visually see parent B and send the child out. They don't even have to come out. So then kid knows I get to go to Starbucks, I get a treat and then I get to see my other parent. And the parents don't, don't engage. A lot of the time too, some people will call that the McDonald's exchange and do it at a McDonald's. And those often, Starbucks or McDonald's really work well because it's easy. You can get something for the kids. They have open hours and there's usually a big parking lot. Or you can just park out in the parking lot and the child, if they're old enough, can get out and just go to the other car. If they're not old enough, um, it's important in your parenting plan to have language where parties will basically confine their conversation to details about the child. If they have to carry child from, you know, A to B, obviously a one-year-old or two-year-old is not going to walk out of the Starbucks or get out of the car on their own. So you might have to do that. Um, another thing can be to have a third party handle an exchange, like your parent or a friend, if it's just that raw and you can't do it and you need to have someone else handle the exchange. But picking a neutral location can help. I will tell you this, do not suggest a police station or fire station. 
sports hate that. It's ridiculous. There's usually nobody there. And how nice do you think it is for your kid to be like, oh, we're going to the police station again to see mom or dad. It's you might think it's like somehow providing safety. It's not. It's just adding to the conflict. No one wants to hear that. I mean, and I get that a lot of people suggest it and they're well intentioned, but just no, no, no. That's all I have to say. Pick Starbucks or McDonald's or you could do the curb to curb drop off at a parent's home where you pull up out front and right in front of the house. Mom or dad comes out to the front door. Kid comes out, says hi. Parent A waves at parent B. Parent B leaves and then do the reverse. Things like that, but make the exchange as peaceful as possible and confine your conversation um, to only kid related things. Again, it goes back to not talking about things in front of the kids. Um, here's the other thing too. This is gonna be hard to hear, but I'm gonna say this. Keep in mind that, especially in Washington, unless there is like actual physical abuse, emotional abuse or neglect that's present, a child deserves uninterrupted time with the other parent. And you also deserve time to decompress and recharge from your obligations during your single parent time. As much as you might not like that other person anymore, they deserve to have uninterrupted time with the child. You don't need to be calling um, you know, every hour when a child is over there and just thinking, oh, well, you know, I'm usually the primary parent, so I need to make sure everything's going on. I'm not saying anyone here is doing that, but this happens. And it just, it leads to distrust. It, you have to let that parent have their time. And you also have to recognize that parenting in two households is not going to be the same. So your house might have different rules, different bedtimes, different everything. And you have to find a way for that to be okay. And that's an adjustment thing. So if you're having a hard time with that, I don't blame you. Talk to people about it, work it out, but you have to, you have to deal with that. Last thing about kids is recognize that your kids have needs too. If they're having trouble coping, um, it might be a good idea to talk about family therapy. If you and your ex-spouse are open to doing that, to talk about the transition, you could do that in a family therapy setting, or you could just do family therapy with your kids um, to help them cope. And it can allow them to discuss their own anger, grief, and sadness over the situation in a way that is, is super healthy. And a, a therapist can also help you establish appropriate boundaries around parent-child roles. I mean, like we talked about earlier, don't use your child as a sounding board, um, you know, and family therapy could be great for that or just therapy for your children. I mean, this is something that in high conflict cases, unfortunately, people do fight about. One parent might be like, hey, my kid really needs to go to some therapy while this is going on and have that um, objective person to talk to that's not one of us. Parent B might be like, no, no, we don't need to do that because, you know, they don't want to, the therapist to hear what the kid might say about them. Um, if that happens, Go to your attorney, you might need to go to the court to seek um, therapy for your child. Because typically, unless there is a restriction on one parent, decisions about non-emergency health care like therapy is a joint decision. So you'll have to be aligned on that. But don't be afraid to advocate for your child's mental health if they need it, um, especially during and post-divorce. There are not, unless your child is really, really young, there are not many courts that will say therapy for a child is the best. Um, it's typically not. So, and if you don't want it for your child, think about why, um, and you know, you might want to consider that. So, a few other things, you know, this is a big thing. Let leave the past behind. It, leaving, and like I talked about this before, bringing up things from the past is really tends to fuel high conflict divorces. Let go of how things could have been or should have turned out. Also, don't talk about or think about. We always planned our kids would go to this school. We always planned I'd ha I wouldn't go back to work until you know X number of years. So this isn't fair because this is what we talked about and always planned on during the marriage. Unfortunately, it really doesn't matter now. Um, and that's really hard to hear. And I'm not gonna say that you know you should never disrupt the status quo because sometimes you you ha you shouldn't, but if you, you know, think, oh, well, we planned on our kids or who are now six and eight, always going to high school in this area, that probably won't happen if things change. So let go of some of that because it, you're going to be fighting about things that don't make any, any sense. Um, and this is the thing, it, this is also going to be hard to hear, but, you know, November's gratitude month. And I think gratitude is super, super important. And it's important that no matter how destructive or how high conflict your marriage might have been, keep in fact, keep in mind that, you know, it, it gave you the opportunity to redefine yourself as a person. So try to focus on what the healthy, positive things are. Try to have gratitude for the people that have been in your life and maybe the good things that came out of it, if children came out of it, um, you know, and just try to have gratitude for that and reshape how you're thinking about the whole thing. And like I said before, 
just drop your baggage with respect to it. When you do that, it, everything lightens and it's one of the best things that you can do. Um, a, a few practical tips for dealing with a high conflict uh, partner or co-parent. So Melissa mentioned earlier, which is so true, keeping things in writing, I cannot stress to you enough how important this is. If you're co-parenting with someone, I highly recommend using Our Family Wizard or Talking Parent. Our Family Wizard is actually a little better. And I'll be honest with you, neither of these programs are super, um, I don't know, the, the interface isn't great. I'm just going to say that. Some people see them and they think, oh, this is really terrible. I don't want to use this. But guess what? Our family wizard's the best one out there. There's an app you can use. There's a calendar feature you can use. And the whole point of something like this is so it's not a situation where someone's like, oh, I didn't get your email. Because the minute that you log in and look at it, it it's logged and everybody knows. Same thing with the calendar. And if you have an accountability system where there's a shared calendar for events, where you only communicate via our family wizard in a really high conflict situation, absent emergency, it de-escalates things. There's also a tone meter that you can turn on that tells you and the other party if your tone needs to be checked and you shouldn't send that message, which is pretty amazing if you ask me, because it took me years to check my tone sometimes in emails and you know it, it does it for you. So that's really fantastic. Talking parents is good too. Our family wizard, um, and I get no, no kickback from them for saying this, it's $99 for a whole year. A lot of people like to say, oh, I can't afford it. It's less than $10 a month. If you can't afford that, then it's not a priority for you. So um, each parent pays that for the whole year. And it's a really, 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 really useful term um, program to use. And unfortunately, if you end up in court, you know, Courts are very familiar with it and the court will order it if you're not using it. You can also give an attorney or a guardian ad litem or anybody else like that professional during your case professional access so then we can see it um, and that can save you time and money because then you're not like downloading and saving all these countless messages. So really, really, really helpful. If you don't have children and you're like, how can I de-escalate um, conflict and contact and keep it in writing? Well, that's really simple. It's email, but I also think you want to limit your emails and your engagement and your connection with that other person if you don't have a reason to. If it's just about property and you need to figure out who's going to pay the bills, who's going to do this or that, go through your attorney for that. A lot of people will try to avoid using attorneys because you have to pay us money for that, but it's money well spent. And typically we can handle something a lot sooner than you might be able to do on your own where you will have infinite back and forth with another person or their attorney. And it will kind of make you crazy. So typically an attorney will say, what needs to happen here let's set up a plan and let's just do it and we'll resolve the issue for you so that's a, a, an important thing you can do but keep your communications in at least in email and not in text i can't stress to you enough text facebook messenger instagram messenger don't do those things and um unless you really need to or want to but those that kind of rapid fire communication is dangerous you can say things that you don't mean those things will be used against you i cannot tell you how many times i have pages and pages of printouts from stuff like this and it's attached to a court file and it's read out loud and it's in the file nobody wants that and you don't want that i would hate for my worst moments you know on social media in the last i don't know how many years to appear in a court file, and I'm sure that you would too. Um, don't ever talk about your divorce on social media. Don't broadcast it. Don't put it out there, how you're thinking or feeling about it, because those things can be taken out of context. And you never know who's looking. You might think, oh, my account's private, and I'm not friends with that person. But you don't know who is friends of friends. You, you really don't know. So it's just better not to do it. I won't go as far as saying shut down all your social media. Some people will tell you to do that. I don't think you need to do that if you just don't talk about the divorce. And if you have kids, also be aware that anything that you post can be taken out of context. So if you're posting about girls night and you went out for drinks, all of a sudden someone could snapshot that and you're an alcoholic. So be, just keep that in mind too. And that sounds terrible. And I hate to sound so jaded about it, but I can't tell you how often these things come up. So be very, very cautious, but I don't want to say don't use it because a lot of people really need social media to stay connected, especially with everything that we've been through during the pandemic. So just be really careful, be really cautious um, and don't talk about your divorce on social media. Another thing, before I will uh, sort of wrap this up here is to know that there is a way through it. And the biggest tip I can give you, like the big takeaway here, and I told you I can't solve your problems because I, I just can't. I'd be doing something else if I could. But the biggest takeaway here is to de-escalate. And when I say de-escalate, you can apply that in any situation. If this other person is raging at you, stop. What can I do to de-escalate it? Sometimes that's not responding. Sometimes it's waiting 24 hours to respond. Sometimes it is writing um, 
they might have sent you five paragraphs attacking you or saying all kinds of stuff. Sometimes it's saying, where is the one question in these five paragraphs answering just that? Deescalate. Take the emotion out, deescalate it. And you can do that sometimes by working through an attorney. You can do it if you're doing something on your own by just doing that one thing, pull out the one question, answer it. And you don't have to make any comment about how you're not gonna respond to the rest, just don't. Or just don't respond at all if it doesn't warrant a response, but deescalate. If you feed into it, you escalate it and it keeps going. Remember what I said in the beginning? This is a marathon, it's not a sprint. So it's not like who can be fast and furious and fight the hardest and get to the end. It just doesn't work that way. And sometimes too, also recognizing that you have to wait for things to happen. That can be really frustrating. And what I mean by that is, you might have gone and gotten an immediate restraining order or protection order, but the court hasn't sent you your order yet. And they might not for a day or two. And that might seem crazy and unfair, but it's just the way it works. You might be waiting for a trial date and that might be for six months from now. And that might feel like unbearable, but the other party just will not set mediation earlier. And there's nothing you can do about that. So you have to just let it play out. You might have scheduled a mediation and right now everything is super, super backed up because it is. And maybe it's not until the new year. And, and honestly, you might be kind of going stir crazy over that, or you might be going crazy because you feel like this other person just keeps contacting you and you don't want contact. Stop the contact and just accept the deadlines and the dates when they are. You can't really change them or do anything about them. The good news is, is that you have them. And so there, there is a time when this will be over and you will get to it. But until then, de-escalate escalating you can like feel your blood pressure rising it's like when you get that message and you feel the stress and blood pressure rising another thing too is set a filter on your email um set a filter so maybe it goes to a folder it's not just popping up in your inbox and then you just go in and check it every few days or so or you use our family wizard which is nice because then you're not getting messages at your email at all so anyway those are a few tips that's a few things to think about i've given you a lot to you know kind of be introspective with and so did Melissa, and I hope that helps. But above all, like I said, you are here. It is the day before Thanksgiving. You are going into maybe your first season dealing with separation and divorce. Maybe you were dealing with this last year too. It, it gets easier, I think, but the holidays can be a super, super, super hard time. They just can be. And so give yourself some grace, give yourself some peace, realize that you should be grateful that you are here today. You're going to be here tomorrow. And at one point, this won't be part of your life. It'll be in the past and you should just focus on moving forward. Last thing I'm going to say, last thing I'm going to say is start living your life like you want it to be. I know that sounds so self-help, but it really is so true. Live the life that you want to have when this is over. Don't dwell on what is going on now. Try to manifest the future. Do not focus on the past. I've said that several times today cannot stress it enough. So anyway, have a great Thanksgiving. Thanks for joining us. I really hope to see you next time um, and reach out and get in touch. I know Melissa's throwing up our information. Yeah, here, so thank you. Great. I'm putting up some contact information here. There was one participant that asked about setting up a consultation. Um, the main person who offered great. answers the phone over at Delino is gone for the holiday weekend, but the phone lines are open 24 seven. There is always somebody that will answer the phone and at least take a message and get you connected to a consultation as soon as possible. So don't worry about um, missing a beat there. Go ahead and give a call if you'd like to get connect for services, okay? One other thing about that too. Yeah, you can, our after hours team is working and they aren't gonna get into a lot of detail the way that our intake person actually right. will, but they can book you the next available that they have on our schedule. You can also go to our website at delinolaw.com and there's literally a scheduled consultation button. So you can click that and schedule it. Um, and you know, here's the thing too, if you don't, I'm just gonna say this, if you don't feel like doing that over the holidays, don't do it. Um, but if you feel like it's something you've been waiting on or thinking on for a long time, just do it. it, it it's, it's not a one size fits all for people. And people think about divorce and separation for two or two, average of two and a half years before they do anything. Um, so you're not alone if you're just thinking about it, or if you're in the middle of something crazy going on, obviously reach out. But you know, if it's too much pressure for you or too much stress, wait until it's not, but don't wait forever. Set yourself up with a timeline and a deadline to make a decision to get help. I mean, not just legal help, help, emotional help. If you want to talk to Melissa or somebody like that, taking that step is really hard for people. So I don't want to minimize that at all. It's easy for me to throw up this information and say, okay, call us or call and talk to us or do whatever. It's easy to say that, but I want to recognize that it can be a very, 
very hard thing to do because then you're like acknowledging there's an issue and you might actually have to take action. And so if you're thinking about it and you, or if you have done it and you're in the middle of a case, I mean, I'm just gonna say this too. If you're out there right now, I don't know how many of you, I can't see who's on this call right now, but how many of you are out there right now? If there's people that are in the middle of this, I mean, I'm proud of you because it's a really tough thing to go through and you're doing it. You're living the change and you probably thought about it a long time before you did it. And now you're going through the holidays and I'm just gonna, for lack of a better term, it's not super professional to say, but it sucks. Um, you know, it just does. You either have your holidays look different because your kids are back and forth or maybe you're alone and you're thinking about how things were, but you are, you're doing the thing. You're doing all the things by getting through this. So um, I'm proud of you. And I'm proud of you for coming to the webinar today and listening to us. And if you're thinking about reaching out, we know it's hard, but do it if, if you're ready. And if you're not, do it later when you are. That's all. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, we'll be in touch and let you know when our next webinar is next month. And um, happy Thanksgiving. Take care. Happy Thanksgiving. Take care. Bye-bye.